complexity. It sounds very sciencey, doesn't it? Everyone loves to talk about complex problems and complex systems, but no one has any idea what it means. I think that understanding complexity is the biggest gap in science today. What do we even mean by complexity? What do we know about it? And what's the problem with trying to explain it? That's what we'll talk about today. How complex do you think these objects are? A rock, a clockwork, a baby? I'm guessing most of you would rate the baby the most complex, the clockwork somewhere in the middle and the rock the least complex. Unless possibly you're a geologist working on a grant proposal, in which case you probably shouldn't be watching YouTube. But why? I mean, babies aren't all that difficult, are they? Stuff goes in one end and comes out the other, and for the first couple of months, that's pretty much it. Okay, you might say, but they grow, they learn to speak, they go on and win Nobel Prizes sometimes. Clockworks don't do that. The baby's more complex not because of what it does, but what it could go on to do. How can we possibly scientifically capture property like that? Maybe let's start with a simpler example, coffee. Or if you're British, imagine it's tea. And we pour milk into it. Initially, you have the coffee and the milk separated. That's very orderly, very non-complex. Then you mix them together and, well, some complex things happen. Then it's completely mixed and that's maximum entropy and non-orderly again. So complexity is somewhere in the middle between the two, between strict order and maximum disorder, between very low and very high entropy. This isn't just the case for latte, it's also the case for the entire universe. The universe started out in a very orderly state, with energy and matter smoothly distributed in space. Smoothly, but not perfectly smooth, with some tiny quantum fluctuations in it. Then the universe began to expand and gravity did its thing. The places where matter and energy were a little more dense collapsed and heated up. They went on to form stars and then galaxies and galaxy clusters. And some of those stars got planets and on at least one of those planets, life evolved. Yet as time goes on, entropy continues to increase. The stars will burn out, the universe will cool and life will no longer be possible. Complexity, life, society, technology is only possible in this intermediate phase between order and disorder, between low and high entropy. The difficulty is making this intuition scientifically precise. And so far, no one's come up with a convincing idea. It's not that no one's tried. The issue is that scientists have too many different ways of quantifying complexity, and they all fall short of capturing it. The most used one is probably algorithmic complexity, also known as Kolmogorov complexity. That's the length of the shortest possible computer program that can generate the data that describes your system. This seems to make sense at first sight, doesn't it? Certainly, you need a more difficult algorithm to calculate what a baby does than what a rock does, right? Yeah, well, think again. Or better, think physics. Both the rock and the baby are made of atoms, and those atoms are made of elementary particles. And the behavior of all those particles is always described by the same mathematics. That's the standard model of particle physics, plus Einstein's general relativity. Baby, rock, clockwork, they all can be described by the same maths. In fact, everything you've ever seen can be described by that, at least in principle. So if you went by algorithmic complexity, everything would be equally complex. That makes no sense. Okay, you could say, but leaving aside that the algorithm is fundamentally the same because everything is made of the same elementary particles, it's arguably true that what a baby does is more difficult to calculate than what a rock does. Can't we figure out a way to measure that? Well, the reason the baby is more difficult to calculate than a rock is not to do with algorithms or their complexity, but with the arrangement of the particles. For a rock, they're simple. All those particles collect to certain mineral configurations that are more or less regular, and then they just sit there.
For clockwork, you have metals but in very specific shapes so that different parts move against each other. And for the baby, you have lots of different arrangements of molecules in cells and organs and the thing moves and wiggles and squeaks. That, in some sense, is what we mean by complex. It's about how the thing is made up, not the algorithm that describes it. What we seem to be missing is a type of structural complexity. Measures for structural complexity also exist, but they too have their problems. They are most commonly used for graphs or networks. Graphs and networks are the same thing. They're lines connected by dots, basically. It's just that in some areas of science, they're called graphs, elsewhere networks. Oh, and the lines and dots aren't called lines and dots because that sounds very kindergarten. If you want to sound educated, you call them links and nodes or edges and vertices. Now about that structural complexity. Let me give you a simple example. Suppose you have a completely disconnected network. That's just a bunch of points. And then you have a completely connected network that connects each point with each other point. Which one's more complex? I'd say they're both equally simple and not complex. For me, complexity resides somewhere in the middle. And indeed, you could use some measure that would tell you exactly that, that they're both equally non-complex. For example, the Shannon entropy for the degree distribution, just so you've heard of it. It's a measure of how dissimilar different parts of the network are. And for both the completely disconnected and the completely connected network, all parts are similar to each other. So according to this measure, they have small complexity. Then again, some people might say that the graph with many connections is more complex. And there are measures for that too. You could, for example, do something like count the number of closed loops or do more complicated things like taking into account the size of the loop or how many edges go out of each node or some combinations thereof and so on. And for all of those measures, the connected network would come out being more complex. But just how much more complex? Well, that depends on the measure. You could use global complexity, average complexity or topological complexity or some other one. All of them measure something and we can debate their pros and cons, but which one's the right one? It's an entire multiverse of complexities. In the end, the structural complexity of networks also doesn't help us much. And just in case you haven't noticed, a baby isn't a network. Okay, so just trying to take some mathematical description, an algorithm, a graph, and trying to quantify something about it didn't really get us very far, did it? Maybe it'd be better to first discuss what we expect of a complex system. One typical feature we expect of a complex system is that they're surprising in some sense. They do things that are difficult to predict and often difficult to understand. We say that they have a lot of emergent properties and behaviours. What does emergent mean? Everything is, of course, still made up of those elementary particles and they always obey the same laws. But if you combine those particles to larger things, it often makes sense to describe them differently, not as a lot of elementary particles, but as bigger things with properties and natural laws of their own right. This is what we mean by emergent, the properties and laws of the bigger things that we use in their own right. A very simple, not a complex, example of an emergent property is the conductivity of a metal. The conductivity of a metal tells you how easily the material transports electrons, so how well it conducts electricity. But that isn't something you find in the standard model of particle physics. It doesn't make any sense to speak of the conductivity of a particle. Still, it's useful to talk about the conductivity of a metal. There are many other such properties like viscosity, rigidity, magnetism and so on. They're all emergent. Similar story for chemistry. Yes, chemistry is ultimately all physics, but that would be cumbersome to use because it's just the wrong language. Much of physics is unnecessarily complicated on the level of chemical reactions. Chemists therefore describe the behavior of different compounds and their interactions by using emergent properties like solubility, acidity, hydrophilicity and so on.
Those were all quite simple examples. But the thing is that the number of those emergent properties and their behaviours seems to increase with what we call complexity. In biology, we might talk about different types of cells and boy, are there a lot of them. And they combine to organs and do all kinds of things like leaving comments on YouTube videos. Lots of emergent behaviour. So emergent properties are one of the characteristics we associate with complex systems, but it's not the only one. We also expect their behavior to be difficult, but not quite chaotic. As Stuart Kaufman put it so poetically, the most complex systems seem to be those that live on the edge of chaos. Complexity increases until chaos sets in. The defining feature of chaos is that very small changes in the configuration of a system can have huge consequences later on. And since you never know the configuration of a system exactly, chaos makes it for all practical purposes impossible to make predictions beyond a certain time. The edge of chaos, therefore, is also the edge of unpredictability. It's on this edge that complexity thrives because it gives you as much variety as you can possibly have without screwing everything up. So we have emergence, the edge of chaos, and the third feature that we often see in complex systems is evolution. Complex systems can learn, they adapt, they self-organize, and they improve over time. This seems to be the major way complexity grows. This third feature is very much about feedback and the resulting change, and it seems to be missing from the measures of complexity that we previously looked at. It's not a property of the structure of a system per se, it's the property of how that structure changes. That makes three characteristics of complex systems. Emergent properties and behavior, the more the more complex, inching towards the edge of chaos, the closer the more complex, and the ability to learn and adapt, the better the more complex. If looking for emergent behavior is the thing to do, you might ask, why is it taking so long? It's not all that hard to tell a brain from a piece of wood, in most cases. So why haven't scientists figured it out? Well, yes, you can tell a brain from wood, but if you had to write it down in maths, could you? When it comes to complexity, we quickly arrive at a point where we're better off classifying systems by what we see and recognize rather than by maths. We're using one complex system, our brain, to recognize others. This is ultimately the same problem we have with consciousness. We're still operating on the level of we know it when we see it, but we can't quite pin down just what we mean by it. It's a pre-scientific stage. The scientific challenge is then to quantify complexity in a way that we can use it to formulate new laws of nature. I think it's the biggest gap in science at the moment because our lack of understanding of complexity is the reason why science is confined to simple systems or simple questions about complex systems. Think about it. In physics, we deal with particles or materials or stars. These are all systems with very low complexity. If you look at areas where the complexity is high, like biology or sociology, we don't have the maths. By the way, this video comes with a quiz on Quiz With It that will allow you to check later how much you remember. You can even collect points from all our videos. There have been a few recent approaches to this question, which I found very interesting because it's such an important problem that receives so little attention. The first one is an idea they call assembly theory. They propose to measure the complexity of objects by how difficult they are to assemble. Basically, they take all the possible ways you can assemble an object and then ask what's the shortest one. They also take into account that to assemble big things, you need to make the smaller things first. So that gives you a history dependence that induces a kind of selection. Some things that assemble fall apart and disappear. Other things that assemble stick and make more of those things. So this is how this assembly idea goes together with the notion of selection and adaptation. They've even calculated this assembly-based complexity for some molecules and found that organic molecules, those that are being used by living things, are indeed more complex according to this measure. So that's very promising. 
I find this a nice idea, but I think it's not quite there yet. It's because some complex objects, like, say, humans, often assemble other objects that are far less complex, say, a pencil. Pencils only exist because humans exist. So I'd argue that when it comes to the entire assembly, a pencil can't be less difficult to make than a human. Yet it isn't itself complex. Another idea is to use the notion of functional information. This idea dates back to 2003 when a biologist pointed out that there are many molecules that fulfill the same biological function. And really fulfilling those functions should be the marker for how complex the molecules are. In a recent paper now, a group of philosophers pushed this further, arguing that the functions that a system can fulfill are a measure for its complexity. This tries to capture the idea that what makes a system complex is what it can do. Again, I think this does capture some aspect of complexity, but it isn't quite there yet, because it's unclear what a function is. You could argue that the function of a rock is sitting on the ground, and it's pretty good at it, yet sitting on the ground isn't exactly a measure of complexity, is it? Nevertheless, I find this development extremely exciting because we might be on the edge of discovering new laws of nature. And I believe that understanding complexity is the stepping stone to understanding consciousness. Forget theories of everything, that's so yesterday. The next big thing in science are theories of complexity. That the world is partly complex and partly chaotic makes it interesting, no doubt, but it can also make it difficult to navigate. This is true especially when it comes to news articles. The same news is often reported dozens of times with a different spin on it. I've often wished for a platform to collect them and compare them and get them rated for accuracy. I've now found such a platform. It's called Ground News and I want to show you how it works. Ground News is a news site unlike any other. Each day they collect more than 60,000 news items from around the world and organize them in one place. They'll show you related stories together and give you a rating for political bias and factuality. Take for example this recent story about Sam Altman who was fired from OpenAI. You see immediately that this is mostly a story of the political middle without any strong left or right bias. You can even see the factuality and ownership scores for the full story as well as the individual news outlets. You can also compare headlines to see how this bias affects framing. For example, you have left-leaning headlines framing this event as surprising and shocking, but the right-leaning headlines assert that Altman must go and that he's been dismissed. Not only does this save you time, but it allows you to spot interesting trends like imbalances in how a story is being covered and whether it's being reported on by reliable sources. They also have this cool feature, which they call the blind spot. It highlights stories that have almost exclusively been covered by either the left or the right. Ground News gives me all the context that I need to make sense of the headlines. And best of all, Ground News is currently having their holiday sale. 40% off their Vantage plan, which includes unlimited access to all their features. It's their biggest sale of the year, so head to ground.news slash Sabine or click the link in the video description. This will get you started for only $5 a month and help an independent news platform that's working to make the media landscape more transparent. Thanks for watching. See you next week.